Hi everyone, my name is Connor. I am a Pluto developer, and I'll be talking about how Pluto notebooks are web APIs. So we're calling this feature, what you see is what you rest. And through a web API, it lets you either get the value of notebook variables as is, or, and this is more important, um, it lets you change temporarily the value of notebook variables and see the response that has in other variables defined in your notebook. Um, and it does so reactively. So if you were to update one cell in Pluto, that will have a cascading effect on other cells, possibly. Um, and we do the same thing, same exact thing, except um, on demand um, when HTTP requests to this API occur. So a really simple example of this would be a notebook with three different cells. We define A and B on the left, and then C in terms of A and B. And this API could set temporarily A and B equal to different values. So in this case, 5 and 12. And then see the result that has on C. And so in that case, C would be equal to 13. Um, but the crucial point here is that it actually doesn't change any of your notebook uh, code or state. Um, it leaves everything as is, but evaluates um, your notebook almost in a hypothetical case. And so let's try this out on a less trivial example. Um, so let's actually hop on over to Pluto now. So what this notebook does is it takes a pre-trained model on the MNIST data set. Um, it's relatively simple. It's just a multi-layer um, convolutional neural network. And uh, it uses that to classify handwritten digits. Now, this is the notebook that we're going to use the API I've been talking about on um, in a different notebook, and also through the Julia REPL. So, I'll just quickly walk through this notebook. Uh, this is where we load the model and the data. Um, this is where we create a list of images that we want to test based on um, these indexes. So 1 to 10,000 is the whole thing. Uh, we can see that the first digit uh, in the data set is a 7, um, which um, we'll see in a second. Our model actually uh, predicts that. So right here is our list of predictions, our raw predictions that come out of the model. And then we can collapse those predictions um, because they come in the form of um, one hot encoding. And so this is our list of final predictions, and this is the list of actual values. So then we just compare those and find an accuracy right here. And so that's really all this notebook does is it takes some images and runs them through the model um, and calculates an accuracy value. Um, so now I'll go ahead and show you uh, the API in action through the Julia REPL. First of all, instead of importing Pluto, we want to use Pluto instead to get a new export. And so first of all, we want to define a variable uh, for our notebook. So we'll make a reference to our notebook by instantiating a new structure called Pluto Notebook. This is exported by Pluto now, um, or will be when the pull request gets merged. Um, and then we want to pass as a parameter a string, which is the name of the notebook. So in this case, the name of the notebook, I'll just pull it from the file picker in Pluto. And we just paste that in there. And so now we have a variable that serves as a reference to our notebook. We can see that this value here is localhost1234. That's just the server that we're going to be connecting to. Um, it just defaults to that because when you run Pluto, that's the default host. Um, but you could see a scenario where uh, you're, you're publishing this API on the internet um, and you'd want to change that. Um, and you can do that by providing a second parameter um, here, which will allow you to change the host that you want to try and connect to with your notebook running on it. So now that we have this reference, 
Um, I'll show you an example of how you can just get uh, notebook variables. So um, you remember we had a variable down at the bottom called accuracy, which is just equal to 9, 0.9801. And so if we just do nb, uh, our notebook reference dot accuracy, uh, it will give us that value. So um, the same goes for virtually any other variable here, um, as long as it can be serialized by native Julia. Um, so let's get, I don't know, output labels, output labels. Uh, and you can see we get a 10,000 element vector containing exactly what was in the notebook. Um, you get the idea, I'll just do it for predictions as well. Um, since that's a matrix, and you can see we get, once again, 10 by 10,000 matrix containing our predictions. So now we can move on to the more interesting part where we provide variables as inputs to our notebook and see the effect that has on other variables. So the way we do that is, is instead of just um, putting a dot directly after our notebook, we actually call our notebook as a function first. So we call notebook as a function and provide the variables we want to change as keyword arguments. So whatever our value is, and then dot, and then the variable we want to get. So I'll get accuracy again, and then for the sake of simplicity, I'll just change output labels, um, output labels and test labels. Um, We'll do a more complex example in a little bit. So let's just say one, two, three, four. And then, yes, test labels equals one, two, and then four, four. So that should have an accuracy of 0.75 because all but one of those is correct. And we see that's exactly the case. So heading back over here, you can see nothing in the notebook has changed. Um, but we're using the same notebook code to evaluate accuracy nonetheless. And so finally, we're just gonna do the same exact thing that we were just doing in the Julia REPL, except now we're gonna do it in a different Pluto notebook. Um, so the nice thing about this is that we can make uh, it interactive now. So we can see in this box, we can just um, draw in a number and click this classify button. And that will send this image to our model and give us a prediction. And so. Uh, we would expect to get about a 98% accuracy since that's what we got on our test data set. Um, so you just see these predictions usually right. Um, I mean, probably right about 98% of the time. So um, let's take a look at this notebook in a little bit more detail really quickly. So right below here, we just have um, essentially a bunch of code to parse this image into something that the model can understand. So um, ultimately what we need is a 28 by 28 pixel image. This is a lot more detailed than that. So we write some code here to perform that transformation uh, using a package. And then uh, finally, we can create an input images variable, which is uh, takes a similar form to the input images variable we have over here. And then we do essentially the exact same thing that we did in the Julia REPL. So we create a new reference to the notebook and then call that notebook as a function where we set that input images variable in this other notebook to our input images variable that we defined up here. And then we want to see our output labels in response. So, um, our output labels will have gone through our model and we can get our prediction that way. And we can see that um, the output labels is a vector of classes. And in our case, we're only sending one image, the image that the user has drawn. Uh, so we get a one element vector. Um, and so just down here at the bottom, we can just get that class by just taking the first element. So quickly, I want to explain some basics on how it works. Um, so data is just encoded um, with either message pack or native Julia serialization, um, depending on what's set in HTTP headers. 
Um, and then there's three main um, points of functionality in this API. Um, mostly so far, we've just been concerned with one, which is the eval functionality, which treats notebook variables um, as inputs and outputs. So um, you can modify variables and see the changes that causes in your notebook. Um, but the other ones, the first is call. Um, that lets you call functions defined inside your notebook. Um, and it will respond with the return value of that function. And then the last is a more experimental feature, um, but it will actually, instead of evaluating uh, the code from what we did earlier on the Pluto server, it will actually send over generated code to a different Julia client, um, the one you're making the request from, and it will attempt to run that code on your local process instead. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here, but once again, everything works a lot in a similar manner to that of the eval endpoint, actually. And so before I wrap up, I'd like to make a couple of closing remarks. Um, first off, be sure to contact me, um, especially so if you think you will use this feature. Um, I'd love to hear more about your use cases, um, and I can try and figure out um, ways that I can tailor the feature more for those use cases. Also, you can contact me if you have any questions or concerns or comments that don't get answered or addressed during the live stream. Also, if you want to try out any of the features from this presentation, be sure to check out the open pull request on the Pluto repository. The pull request number is 1052, and you can see the link on the presentation here. And thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this talk interesting. Um, and if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the YouTube uh, chat, and I will answer them momentarily. All right, thank you, Connor, for the amazing talk. What you see is what you rest. Um, really exciting. I think kind of a question for me is how easy will it be for users to use this to write an API? Like, do you need to be a web developer? Yeah, so the idea is that you can use it from either Julia or uh, anywhere outside because it's HTTP. Um, and so, really, I actually made an example web application um, that calls these endpoints just from JavaScript instead. And it's really easy. All you have to do is encode your variables um, in message pack instead of with Julia serialization. Um, there's a couple things that don't work the same with message pack. Um, for example, um, you can't directly encode matrices, but you can encode most things. Um, so I guess the answer is it's, it's very simple. It's almost as simple as doing it just directly from Julia. Very really cool. Okay, Connor, just to recap, uh, does this mean that any notebook is already like an API? And I'm saying this because a lot of people are watching and the idea is that the machine learning world has the problem that you write it and then you have to rewrite it to deploy it. Is that gone? Yep, that's completely gone. You know, your notebook is already an API. You don't have to do anything. Um, this feature, when it's eventually in uh, Pluto release, it will just already be enabled. Um, so really, all you have to do is just um, write your notebook in a way where reactivity works well, um, which I think Pluto does a great job of encouraging you to do that already. Um, and yeah, everything should just function out of the box as an API. That's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> Can you edit your notebook while API is running? Yes. Is so that that's another, <laughs> that's another really interesting um, part of this feature is that um, all the editing features still work. Um, and so requests that you make um, or changes that you make in your notebook will immediately reflect in the API. Um, so while you're developing, that makes uh, you know interfacing uh, with your notebook and debugging it. Um, really simple. Awesome. That's super cool. Uh, Panayotis, anything from you? Yeah. F final final question. Um, the, the last endpoint you, saw, you, you showed us, 
uh, it was about getting the static code. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I, I quite got that. Can you say more about this? Yeah. So when I was demoing um, the evaluation, so when I was passing in um, the image um, to our model, um, it was evaluating all that code on the Pluto server. So the same place that it's evaluating the code um, for your editor. What the static endpoint does is it does the same exact thing as eval, except instead of running that notebook code on the Pluto server, it will run it from wherever you made that request. So in the example with the Julia REPL um, that I did, um, instead of calculating the accuracy on the Pluto server, it will calculate it in the Julia REPL instead as a function. Super cool. All right, awesome. Thanks again, Connor. Of course. Let's go to the next talk by Nick, is that right? That's right, I'm assuming. Okay, the next talk is by Nick. See you there. <laughs>